feeling lucky. I'll roll the dice. <laughs> yeah. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, I'm Daniel Gowan. I am uh, co-founder with Dr. Dina Hijazi. We are co-founders of D2 Counseling, and we are delighted you're all here with us tonight. Um, we have with us Ann Heinrich, who's going to talk uh, here in just a moment, but let me introduce D2 Counseling. We co-host this with the Unity Church of Dallas, and clearly y'all are not sitting in the Unity Church of Dallas. We had to move to the Zoom platform. I guess it was back in March or April, and uh, we've March. got... yeah. Yeah, and we've got quite a few folks who are loyal attendees, and we appreciate that. Um, D2 Counseling offers therapy to individuals, couples, uh, families, and we do a lot of groups. We do uh, workshops as well as uh, individual therapy. Um, we also have, by uh, I would mention that we've got a couple of openings for women in one of our groups. So if you know of a woman who would be an appropriate, who's looking for group therapy, we do have an opening there. And then I would mention that next month, let me pull my, I want to get this just right. Next month we have Playback Theater using action methods to validate, empower, and inspire. You see why I had to read that off? Mm -hmm. That is September 15th by Katrina Hart. And she does psychodrama and she's always a really good speaker. So we would welcome you back for that as well. Um, the other thing I'd say is if you're interested in CEUs for tonight's uh, uh, lecture, I will post an, um, info at D2 Counseling. If you'll shoot us an email, we'll get you the CEUs for that, and I'll post that uh, over in the chat section so you can reference that uh, email address. And Anne has already graciously put down her email address. She's going to have some books up to show us later if you have some in interest in the books that she's going to be talking about or any other material, feel free to reach out to her. And then towards the end of the presentation, if you have questions you wanna follow up with her on, go ahead and post them in chat. And if we have a chance, we'll get to them later on. Dina, was there anything else that you wanted to mention? No, you covered it all. Well done. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, ask everybody to mute, and that will give the floor to Ann, who will, who is labeled as John, actually, on her. Yes, I'm using my husband's computer tonight. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, well, I, I knew you had undergone a name change, but uh, with that, we'll, yes. we'll listen at attentively now for you, Ann. Thank you for being here tonight. You're welcome. Um, hello, everybody. I'm a licensed marriage family therapist. And I'm also a parent of adoptive kids and foster kids and biological kids. So um, it's a very different, at least it was for me and people that I talked to, it's a very different experience um, raising and going to school with and all the drama and trauma that come with kids, <coughs> excuse me, um, that, you know, you didn't start fresh with, so to speak. Um, one of the interesting things to me is kind of how the course of adoption has gone over the years. Um, that, you know, there was so much silence and secrecy and um, really, you know, you didn't even tell the kids they were adopted because especially if you brought them home from the hospital, they were going to be just like your family. And then people found out, well, wait a minute, these are things that we've never had in our family. And um, there were a lot of problems because no one really knew why these kids would be any different. You got them as a baby. And, um, and so there was a lot of uh, misinterpretations and conceptions and ideas about kids. And then um, it kind of picked up and uh, people figured out as time went by, it started out with mostly people who couldn't conceive. And then that spread to more families, more couples, uh, other kinds of things. And then the rates dropped for adoption <coughs> a little with the introduction of birth control pills and um, with uh, abortion. So that prompted a lot more uh, international adoptions, um, intercountry adoptions, uh, kinship adoption. I was going to talk a little bit about different kinds. Kinship adoption, a lot of that is done without paperwork. <coughs> we see a lot of grandparents, excuse me, 
raising grandchildren this day, and they may or may not have gone through the legal system um, to make that a legal adoption. So there are probably more adoptions than we know of. They're estimated at about 2% of all the kids under 18 are adopted. Excuse me while I get a drink. Which surprised me. Because when you're working with adoptive kids, it seems like that's all you see. <laughs> um, and then um, uh, there was a lot of corruption. And so some countries closed their doors to adoption. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen the one child uh, policy for China, the movie that a family, I believe they're in Kansas, has produced a documentary that to keep up with the children that were being requested, mostly from um, European and American countries, um, they were actually kidnapping and taking children. And some of those children are now being identified through DNA and meeting their actual families and parents in China. So uh, there's been a lot of controversy on some of this and a lot of different ways that uh, countries have handled adoption. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that um, is also noticeable is that um, the, the age of most adoptions is within the first year of birth. And then that leaves the other kids um, kind of strung out there. And um, in, the, in the later years, they decided that those kids were actually adoptable. And a lot of services came to be that helped look for people that could take these kids and to offer post-adoption services because they're finding out that this is just not your normal parenting. And these kids have a lot more uh, percentage-wise difficulties in life, in school, with friendships, learning disabilities, things like that, that are disproportionate to the number that are actually adopted. Um, some of the adoptions are they are called failed adoptions and they're the percentage i saw was 11 percent before they're finalized there are also ones that are disrupted after finalization and some of those have hit the news this year a famous blogger um, rehomed her adopted child um, one family you know sent the grandmother and the, and the child back to russia and said, we can't take him. Um, sometimes the circumstances really are tough and currently there's no system unless you delinquish them for foster care or something on what to do with the, the things that you just, you know, as a family, you just can't handle. And um, so there was a lot of feedback, pushback on the gal's use of the worst rehoming. Um, they had already found a placement and um, the child had come from China and there were so many things that they weren't aware of. I think they were into it about four years before they realized that this was, this was not going to work. Um, when you talk to families about their adoption, where did the kids come from? How were they treated? What's the circumstance? A lot of kids are entering uh, foster care and adoption because of addictions. A lot of parents are losing their children because of drug and alcohol. Um, that's kind of spiked. Um, in the past, there had been more neglect and, um, and abuse. And of course, those things are still current problems. Um, and then when you look at where a child was adopted from, a lot of the ones from Russia and Romania and China um, seem to peak in some families as really severe trauma problems. Um, depending on the orphanage uh, from Africa, we have, we have a few adoptive kids and the orphanage they were in, you know, they were lucky to get a meal once a day. The caregivers go home at the end of the day, they're left alone in cribs all night till the following morning. Um, and then you wonder if these kids are gonna be able to attach. Um, you know, if you're there very long, it's going to be pretty tricky on why would you ever trust an adult. You know, some of the orphanages in China, some of them are assigned almost like your own nanny, and they take you home at nights, and they take you home on weekends. So if that's your start to life, 
um, how you do in a family bodes much better than the one that's left in a crib and there are 25 of them and one attendant and all they can do is feed and diaper and move on. So when you get these children at an early age or a later age, some of those are great questions to be asking. You may not get the correct information, but it could make a difference on your outlook on uh, what you think these kids are coming with, um, what kinds of things, what kinds of issues. Um, we used to think that, you know, gosh, if they're a baby, there shouldn't be any problem. And to be perfectly honest, I'm very curious with the increase in surrogates um, that that technically is an adoption. A uh, baby was with a mom for nine months, heard her voice, heard her routine, all those things the entire time, and then whisked away to a family, a couple, whatever. And if that's going to have the same effect as we find some of the infant adoptions in other families um, that uh, were not done through surrogacy, but they, they may or may not have the same genetics, um, but there's certainly, I think, enough room for thought on how does this affect or does this affect a child? And um, there's, there's quite a, a group of different voices speaking on whether what kind of effects this might have on a child entering a family. Um, in the last uh, five years, uh, foster care has gone up to over 400,000 and um, adoptions remain a little lower than, than the norm. Um, but the interesting thing with foster, some of the foster programs are geared strictly towards as much reunification as possible. Other foster programs are geared towards having those children adopted. Um, and that's the primary purpose and the end purpose. And so there are different kinds of systems, different kinds of um, services in the community and different kinds of agencies um, that work with those kinds of kids. Um, one of the things that uh, we find out too is that uh, the kids who are entering the system, uh, if you uh, notice that the Kaiser um, questionnaires and surveys and study, the ACE study, they, the adopted children have chronic health and poor outcomes. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't bode well for those kids, except for the fact that if you put them in a stable, loving, con consistent family, they will certainly do better than had they been left in some kind of institutional care. And so that's the good thing. Um, there's a new therapies that are, that are developed and being used, trauma systems therapy, um, which really look, takes a look at the child's trauma um, rather than the old ways of what we thought with adoption. Um, th these are some myths. Um, my love is enough to erase all the bad things. My child should be grateful and love me as much as I love him or her. My child shouldn't feel love or feel loyal to an abusive parent. It is better just to move on, forget, and not talk about past painful experiences. A lot of people get into this thinking some of those things, or certainly a lot of their friends do. Uh, when we got our two kids, um, they were eight and five, and uh, we, we had a, like a baby shower because we didn't have clothes and things for kids that age anymore. And um, so many of them said, oh, I bet they're so grateful. And I'm like, uh, no, they are not grateful. And matter of fact, they're really not even crazy about us. Um, but they call you mom, they call you dad. And that's that really not distinguishing between uh, who's safe and who's not safe in adulthood. Um, we, we don't really care. Somebody will pick us up and take care of us. And um, so they would have walked off with strangers and called them mom too. But um, a lot of people thought, and I think as parents, there's a part of that is that, gosh, we're really doing a lot for you. Um, couldn't you appreciate us or love us or hug us or want us or 
Um, and it's a broad spectrum of how involved each child is with the parents. They may not want any connection at all physical, and others may be climbing all over you um, because they have a different set of needs. But with the trauma-focused therapy, you're really asking the question of what has happened to make this child do this? What has happened that has brought this child here? Uh, what has happened that maybe has triggered this kind of behavior or these kinds of actions? Um, where did they come from and, and what were their, the, the things that they saw or the things they experienced before they got to my house? And uh, you know how traumatic would that be or how stressful? Not all stress is trauma but a lot of these kids it works into trauma in their cases and then their nervous system can't handle things and when their nervous system can't handle things you see a lot of uh, poor outcomes and behavior problems and sensory issues and um, it's not uncommon for an adoptive or foster child to be in multiple resources occupational therapy, physical therapy, tutoring, um, maybe some kind of extra medical care, uh, counseling, family counseling, uh, you know, it just, there's an array of it. And I, I think a lot of times as parents or as therapists, we think, well, what's the big deal? Um, but it's exhausting. It's exhausting for the kids. It's exhausting for the families to be spread around like that. Um, when we got our kids, we weren't allowed to use babysitters or daycare for the first six months because they thought that would increase our bonding. I'm not sure it did, but it was certainly an interesting six months um, to have the full scope of both kids and really uh, no help or support other than um, the weekly counseling at the adoption agency. And I considered us lucky. Um, we lived in a very small town, but, it, but a woman there had started an adoption agency, became known throughout the state for its excellence. So we were in such a small community, it was not unusual to run into other parents and other kids that were part of the adoption system. So we had more of a support. Um, I think in some of these cases, you just, you feel like, you know, oh, I'll be fine especially if you have birth kids, which we did, and they were um, really good kids. And so uh, we were not prepared for how challenging this was gonna be. Um, we were good parents. One of the things that they noticed with most adoptive families, and we're talking two to 5% of families that adopt, usually have higher incomes, they're higher educated, um, and so they've got resources and skills that not just any average parent would have. And yet these kids are extremely challenging. And you aren't sure, well, it worked on this, it didn't work on this. And uh, so there's a lot of changes. Um, one of the things I wanted to say was how some of those children respond to trauma with hyperarousal which is the jumpiness and nervousness and getting startled. Um, Re-experience where they have images, sensations and, emory, and memories um, that are kind of uncontrollable. They pop in and pop out. And then avoidance and withdrawal where they feel numb or frozen or shut down and withdraw. And uh, they really don't have, um, those three do not really have very good coping skills. And so you're bringing in a child that's going to have to adjust and maneuver all kinds of new things. And they don't have what you would consider basic skills, probably, for whatever age that child is. Um, our kids were eight and five. And um, um, to be honest, we'd never been called into the office or the principals or our kids hadn't had detention. and. Um, and, and, you know, they're not perfect, but, you know, we just had a really easy time. And all of a sudden, um, I'm on speed dial with the principal. And, you know, what have they done today? And, uh, and now who do I need to apologize or talk to? And um, 
And it was nothing that they were doing out of maliciousness, but you don't realize how much teaching goes on in a normal home with a child that they learn skills you don't even know they know. And so these kids are completely unprepared and they tell it all or show it all or act out because of uh, fear and trauma, um, fight, flight, or freeze. And um, we ended up with uh, pretty much two fighters. And so we got a lot of calls. And one of the things that really saved us is um, we were known in the community for our other kids. And so when things would go crazy, they didn't look at us like, you are the worst parents in the universe. Um, and so we always felt a little sense of grace and relief that they knew we were good people and good parents and we were doing the best we could. And I can't help it that he drug your daughter into the bathroom and gave her a concussion, you know, or um, that she decided to tell all of second grade class about condoms. Um, you just, every day was kind of a surprise. And when you don't have a lot of support, it gets to be exhausting. And if you're trying to parent them the way you parent other children, you're probably not gonna have much success. And then it gets into a cycle of um, discouragement and resentment. And, um, and not everybody is sympathetic to an adult. They're sympathetic to the kids and then they wonder, um, well, what's wrong with you? And so um, working with adoptive families is really a wonderful thing because you get to hear them sigh of relief, you know, oh, today was the worst of my whole life. And you know they're good people and they mean well and they're trying. And so what can we do to help these be successful placements and how can we help these kids um, succeed? And, and get ahead. So um, the more parents know about what causes trauma, what the effects of trauma are, what are the symptoms of trauma, um, we get them better prepared so that they can help their kids in training and retraining and training and retraining um, so that some of those become permanent habits. Uh, one of the things uh, that I thought was really interesting is um, a lot of people talk about uh, reactive attachment disorder. And uh, I, I think when you know a lot about trauma, you're not surprised that some of these kids would have such attachment issues and whether or not you can change them, depending on the age and the trauma of the kid, um, is really a tough call. Uh, when they used to do a thing called holding therapy in several places in Colorado, and it got to be kind of controversial. Um, but trying to get these kids to fold into you, to look you in the eyes, um, to be able to make a connection. And so it was quite popular for a while. And then, you know, when you're told, you know, you don't need to go to that because I, it's not going to work on your kid. And at that time, it was like, well, now what do we do? You know, do you just parent from a distance? And they're already not connected, which just breeds more disconnect. Um, a lot of discipline methods um, that you would use for kids who are attached don't work for kids who aren't attached. Um, building independence in your children. You kind of push them a little bit and you hug them and push them a little more and you get them out there and you cheer for them. And uh, with kids with attachment disorder, you kind of have to pull them into yourself because they're already kind of running on an independence track where they're not gonna need people or relationships. And uh, so when you think you're pulling back and letting them be independent, sometimes it's going against the grain of what they really need, which is to be attached, which is to be able to develop trust and know that certain people are going to be available for them. And so uh, one of the things that's really difficult in discipline is thinking uh, timeouts. A lot of families use a lot of timeouts, sending them to their rooms, and then 
they, they don't understand that that just breeds another sense of isolation, um, that you're not good enough and that's why you're sent away. And so that stigma continues for children, but it works on other kids because the other kids want to be close to you. So uh, there are a lot of things in discipline that uh, need to be kind of rediscovered. One of the books that I use is called The Connected Child, and I will show this afterwards. And um, I'd like to read a little sample of The Old Way Doesn't Work. Harsh punishments are, aren't effective for gaining compliance. At risk, children respond far better to a constructive approach to discipline, one that guides them to think consciously about choices and consequences without being shamed. Forget about using anger and harsh punishments, lectures, sermons, or tirades, or bribery, and definitely not debate, because that gives them equal footing, equal power, when you want to be the adult in, cha in charge, and they don't have the discernment to be able to carry that weight. Shaming a child and simply hoping to behave properly next time is unrealistic. So the kids really need your guidance to respond quickly, to clarify expectations, to offer simple choices, to present consequences, and give immediate retraining and opportunities for redo. And a lot of parents parent like that. You know, they have a consequence and they tell them what it is, but you also hear a lot of parents, you know, like, all right, when I get to three, or okay, I'm counting now, or um, okay, that's it. You're not getting a birthday party. Um, none of that teaches a child what they need to be taught, which is how to behave in that certain circumstance. And the more that you can do upfront loading of consequences that make sense, that are simple to deliver, that don't get emotional, and teaching them what the behavior is that's expected. Okay, we're going to a store. You tell, your, you tell a lot of kids, hey, you don't get to buy anything today and you're fine. And you tell other kids, oh, you don't get to buy anything today and they're on the floor dragging you by the, by the legs all the way through the store. So a lot of it is preparation um, and knowing, oh man, I didn't know they didn't know that. Okay back up and let's figure out how to reteach that. And uh, not to have such high expectations. I, I think because we want to do a good job, those of us who have adopted or taken kids for foster, we want what's best for them and we think we know how to get there. Um, but it's like you're both from a foreign language, you're both reading a different book. And um, to help train them and get them on the page that you're on, and yet recognizing individual differences, that uh, they, they may come with some similarities, a lot of similarities, but they're also individuals and they come with genetics. And so they may have a predisposition towards certain things. Um, one of the nice things that we found out is that um, our kids were such animal lovers, I mean, above and beyond. And, you know, I'm fine with a dog. Um, but that's pretty much it. And oh no, you know, you know, snakes and cats and lizards and anything, you know, when can I have a this or a that? And uh, mostly I answered when you're 18 and you move out, you can have that. But um, they loved them. And then artistically, um, they had so much more talent than our birth kids, you know, for doing clay and painting and making things. And they were a delight to see what they came up with. Well, guess what? Birth mom, birth dads, they had different birth dads, had those qualities. And when they got older and they saw a picture of the birth mom with all these animals, it was like, ah, oh, that clicks. That's where I fit in. That's one of those puzzle pieces. And I, I think it's difficult because we don't get enough, give enough credit for where they came from and some of the, the things they bring with them that may not all be wonderful, but they certainly have some strengths. Um, and uh, to, to know how to, how to lean towards that, how to encourage and press them forward 
in the areas that you see, oh, there's a chance here for a future. Um, so that they don't all end up, you know, through the juvenile justice department. Um, although that's an exciting route to take also. Um, we've been to uh, juvenile hall where I swear we were the only people without tattoos. And um, we've been to group homes. We've been to residential facilities. We've been to therapeutic foster homes with, with a couple of times with different kids. And you just pull in every resource you can to figure out how to cope with this or how to get the best results for those kids. Um, one of the things um, I have signed up for um, Covenant Kids to help do some counseling because those kids are on Medicaid. It's a Medicaid, right? Um, and so they don't really pay much and it's hard to get good people to take, you know, crappy pay, frankly. But what a difference it made for us because those kids were expensive. They did a lot of damage. We had a lot of bills a lot of the time. I don't know how that always worked out, but something was always broken. And if we had had to pay for really top quality counseling the years when they needed it, it would have broken us. And so to have a system in place that helps those families get counseling and uh, support and um, some teamwork. These, these people have teams that come alongside you and how can we help and do this and that. And so it's really a wonderful opportunity for people who are interested in um, doing more for children in a real concrete way. Um, for some people, it also helps to just be that backbone, to be the support, to be the person that takes your kid every Tuesday after school so you can just kick your feet up for three minutes. Um, it's important to have a support system and uh, realizing that the support comes from, you know, your church, your school, your friends, your sports teams, um, wherever you can find it but invest in making those connections that will help you take care of yourself as you take care of these kids. Um, one of the things I, I picked up from Institute for Family Studies uh, was a 2016 survey of over 14,000 students, 436 which were adopted, and here are the statistics on how likely they were to need, need help. If they were adopted, they were two times more likely to be, con the parents were contacted over schoolwork. They were three times more likely to be contacted over classroom behavior problems. They were four times more likely to repeat a grade. They were three times more likely to be suspended or expelled. And they were, it was 10 times higher to have a severe mental disturbance. So to think that you're getting these kids and, you know, oh, they're cute and everything's fine um, is a disservice to the child and to your family. And so realizing that, that these things are not insurmountable, but they are going to be things that take your attention that take your time, that take your energy. Um, one of the books that I picked up is called Voice Lessons for Parents. Is that backwards? Um, anyway, um, it's really about communicating and tone of voice and things like that. And uh, it's an excellent source for whether your kids are adopted or just plain old homegrown. And, um, and it's, it's been wonderful. Um, there are a lot more things out there available. A lot of kids who have trauma because their nervous systems are not adapted. Um, they have sensory problems. And so one of the nice things is um, their sensory, we've learned so much more about sensory processing disorder. Um, it can also go along with ADHD and learning disabilities. You can have one, two, or all three. And, um, this one on uh, the out-of-sync child is good when you just have those kids you think, 
I'm, there's just something that's not right and I'm not sure what it is. And are they, are they able to sensory process because they don't have some of the skills because their nervous system is such a traumatized mess to be able to do some of the basics. And so this is an excellent system to be able to say, oh, well, here's where we're short, here's where we need more. And, um, and because our brain is so malleable, a lot of these things can be retracted so that these are areas where kids can be and become successful. Uh, I'm trying to think if there was, uh, I didn't talk that much about radical um, attachment disorder. It's, it's a hard pill to swallow because it sounds so scary. Um, but I think it re realistically, a lot of these kids have been bounced around and gone from place and parents um, so that they don't have a reason to attach to trust. Um, we got our foster kids, they were, they were teenagers and they had just turned 13. And um, they were well attached to their mom all those years. And so they had some sense of security and a sense of self that I think if they had been through the system those 13 years, instead of staying at home with mom, it would have had a different effect. Um, but it was funny because uh, they didn't have the same level of expectations that a lot of families do, which is just basic communications. And so we spent a lot of time practicing uh, conversations and you know, like, okay, you want to say hi to this person, and then what's the next question? Uh, so how do you like school? Okay, there's a start. And then they say, and we would practice in the car, then they say, oh, I don't like Mr. White. And then you say, ooh, I say, I don't like him either. I hate that guy. He's such a jerk. Okay, back up. They don't need that much information in your first conversation. So let's start again. Or um, they would, they didn't understand a lot of why things happened the way they did. And like, well, why are you asking me how my day was? Well, you know, a lot of families, that's kind of what they do. But you asked me yesterday. And so you go, oh, yeah, I did. But, I, you know, I just, just kind of wanted to know. So, um, so there are quirks with kids that were well cared for even in their early years that you find out um, or may not expect or developmentally delayed in the sense that they're immature and don't have skills or don't have uh, the, the goals of independence. <coughs> so there's a lot of variety. Um, I think one of the things that was really helpful for us is that we didn't have all six kids in the house all at once. So we really were able to be more specific and find the right education for each child, uh, the right program, the right, what we considered to be the right people um, to put in their lives, the kinds of sports that we thought they could play in and not, you know, be the worst or be, be bullied or die at. And, um, and so there's a, there's a lot of joy in watching them bloom, um, but there are a lot of weeds. And so you just need to take that into consideration that, um, that they're high needs and um, to ask for help because there's no way you know the answers. And I, you know, I think uh, looking back, I know one of the things I wish I had been better at, I wish I had been more nurturing. I'm pretty much a straight shooter. And so to realize that these kids who were having trouble attaching needed a lot more of my soft side than I probably gave because I wanted to make sure that they got it right, that we did things in a, in a, in a method or a process that would build for them. And, you know, they're capable adults, you know, as, as long as we're not, they're not living with us and we're not paying their bills, I'm happy. So, um, so it's been a, a long route in some ways. 
Um, I was going to end with a quote from um, The Connected Child on Hope. <clears throat> Parents sometimes come to us with broken hearts. They feel they have drained their hearts, finances, and energy, but have gotten no positive response from a child. They feel spurned and run dry, that their marriage has been wrecked, their health has been ruined from sleepless nights. They feel guilty to admit they no longer love their child. We tell them it is okay not to feel love for your child right now, but it is important to be kind to your son or daughter. Just make it to your goal to try and understand what your child needs and to help him or her feel safe. As your child begins to feel safe, watch if you just don't find room for love to grow again. So if there are any questions or comments, this would be a, a great time to jump in. You know, there's enough, there's, uh, it's a fairly small group where anybody that wants to unmute, we can continue the, the discussion. Or if you have questions, just go ahead and ask them uh, rather than going through the chat. That would make it easier and far more relational. Yes, Brian. So I, I appreciate the very real, um, way that you describe the challenges in those relationships. I've worked in group homes and other facilities that dealt with foster kids and it, it rings a bell. But however, um, and as one who's debating adoption myself, mm -hmm. what, with, with all the challenges, what drives you to do it? You know, it's interesting why different people do it. We've, we really enjoyed being parents and we felt like we had what it took resources wise to love a few more kids in our family and, um, and not go through more pregnancies. Mm -hmm. And so we just kind of started on that path to see where it would go and, um, you know, being matched with kids and having it fall through and then rematched. And um, we just kind of went one step at a time mm -hmm. until we felt like we were at the spot and these were the kids and we opened the door and let the chaos be in. And the following through process that you talked about, I, I, I have spoken to a lot of foster parents that have gone through that. And, and some of them have said that's, that is sometimes one of the worst parts. Because mm -hmm. the social workers always say, well, don't get attached. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you put up with all this if you don't have some level of attachment? Right, right. I think it's improved too, where it used to be if you got a foster kid, you knew they were not staying. They were moving on. Right. And now, and now in a lot of places, they've worked really hard to keep those kids in the same home. And some of them have become adoptable. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what all the laws are in Texas. I'm from California, but they really cut short on how long parents have for reunification. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you have to see a kid 12 years old and mom and dad still have all their rights and they haven't done anything to help. Right and now nobody wants them. So, you know, if they haven't done anything that the court has ordered them and the child's been in foster care two years, that's pretty much the limit anymore. And okay. then, then they're freed for adoption. Yeah, that's the system I'm most familiar with. They say it's six months, but it can go to 18 months, no problem. Yeah. They know the game. Right. Thank you right. very much. Well, if no one else has a question, I have one more. Sure. <laughs> um, do you work with uh, adoptive parents specifically? I'm hoping to more. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes, I have. Um, I worked with a kind of an adoption agency with the families that they thought the adoption was going to be disrupted. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would step in and work with the family to see if we could turn things around and they could work it all out, which had been a, fail a failure of the adoption. Yeah, which well, they turned out there, to be successful. Oh, good. Was there a theme that you enter that you entertained or you worked with from time to time? Is anything you noticed? Um, I, I think probably the discouragement thinking maybe there's somebody that can do it better. 
and the realization is is nobody can do it any better than you're doing it mm -hmm. and same for the kids they're going to be who they're going to be wherever they're going to be mm -hmm. so you know they're breaking you in um they're going to do the same anywhere else and then it's just one more place so if you mm -hmm. can kind of step back from how you personally feel yeah and say i'm going to do this for these kids as if you know they're not my kids in a way mm -hmm. so i can parent a little from a distance from a distance yeah yeah and um you still give them the same kind of love but there's a, there's a kind of a difference in how you look at it mm -hmm. so that you, you're looking at a goal far out there um mm -hmm. and not getting caught up in you know today they hated my guts right well you must have done something right then yeah yeah <laughs> It's, it's How long does it take to, for them to, for the break-in period? I know it's different with every kid, but on average, what do you well, tell Well, I would say after uh, 20 years, we're still breaking in one. Okay. Um, the other three, one of them had probably only took, you know, if I say breaking in, I mean really feeling like he felt like part of our family. Right. It probably took about two years. Okay. And, and what's funny is that... Um, he always tells everybody that he's my favorite. And the other siblings, they go, no, you're not, and everything else. And the funny thing is, is he honestly believes it, mm -hmm. which is yeah. great yeah. because he drove me nuts. Fine. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. But, um, you know, there's just uh, some ways I just think um, they can get their hearts wrapped around being part of your family yeah and um and maybe they have to they have to distance and come do the yo-yo thing kind of to feel safe enough but and that's self-protective um, as well for them right right okay. and, you, and you just learn to accept it and not take it personally right right yeah you you do pay this pay the pay the freight for a lot of folks behind you or in front of you <laughs> earlier yeah. or whatever. no kidding i wanted to get a t-shirt that said i did not make these messes right yeah i know <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, you know, one of the I things... I give parent, uh, foster parents the Golden Broom Award because that's all they do is clean up other people's messes. So. Yeah, yeah. I can remember people saying, um, you know, if you want to come over sometime, that would be great, but please don't bring the kids. Ooh. You know, and then it's like, okay, now, now what do I do with that? Right. Or trying to find a babysitter. You know, it's very challenging because the kids were so challenging. Yeah. 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 We well, were lucky enough. Much. We were lucky enough to find a high school girl that wanted to teach special ed. Oh, that's good. And she was a babysitter from heaven. Oh wow. <laughs> that's a blessing. That's a huge blessing. Yep. And with all your experience in hindsight, what do you wish you'd known then that you know now? I wish I had understood, I understood that they came damaged, but I didn't really understand the trauma of where they had come from and how it affected them uh, really down to their cores. I wish I had known more about trauma work. There is a, uh... There's a podcast on This American Life. I think it's called Accepting Love. I can look it up. But um, it talks about a family who um, brings in a child from Europe uh, or from Russia somewhere. And um, they go through uh, an awareness of how traumatized he was. And they try to um, reattach. And I think the mother stays within 18 inches of him for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And it nearly breaks the family apart, of course. And what's fascinating and really enriching is they have audio of this boy going through his bar mitzvah, at, and, and they, su they successfully reconnected. And he wow. talks about his crazy family and how much they went through for him. And, and there's, at least at that time, some level of recognition of how difficult it was. And I mean, from the outside, when I heard that the first time, I didn't understand trauma as well as I do now. Mm -hmm. But I suspected, you know, at the time that all that trauma was keeping that kid from connecting and from, uh, from attaching out of just survival and fear. And, and it just, they had more patience to outlast his fear than he had fear. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, it was, it's a remarkable story, but. I uh, bet. 
it, it's, uh, it really does a, it does a good thing in, in illustrating the level of trauma that some kids are in. It seems that in the families that I've worked with, the ones that are from Russia or Romania, oh man, it's like, you know, you knew in the old days with Ceausescu how those orphanages were run and you knew the damage. And so it's surprising to see a four-year-old today from that country that is just as damaged. Um, I'm not sure how things are run, but those kids are really difficult. They have a lot of pain and a lot of medical um, abuse that they're so afraid of any kind of medical procedures. It makes you wonder what went on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have a friend. I have a friend who's wanting to foster children and hopefully adopt. How do you suggest would be the best way for me to support her? I don't know that she really understands what she's getting into with the attachment. Um, finally, I think a lot of friends have convinced her to foster first versus going to direct adoption. But what 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 would be good for me to do to help her along that with that process? I would probably, um, you know, share information. Uh, oh, look what I found. Um, this is really interesting. Or, you know, go to an adoption meeting with her and then ask some really good questions that might help her think about some things. Um, to talk to other adoptive parents or kids and, um, you know, see if she can't make friends with some of those families. Uh, you know, sometimes if you start on the outer circle and work your way in, uh, it makes more sense. And just, you know, check her motivation. I mean, if you're really good friends, you know, what do you really want out of this? And if you can't get exactly what you want, which is a darling baby girl to dress up, um, are you going to be okay? because different people have such different reasons for adopting. And if you're doing it to fill a hole in your life, it's gonna be a lot more difficult than coming from a place of, I really don't need this kid, but I want to do this. Do you recommend um, couples or couples with children going to um, attending some type of counseling prior to adoption or if they're considering adoption? Absolutely. The more information you can have ahead, the better prepared you are for you, um, which we didn't, we didn't really prepare ahead. Uh, you know, we drove over and picked them up and brought them home. <laughs> with their plastic bags of all kinds of oddball stuff. Um, we, we didn't really have a lot of prep for our, for our kids at the time. And we thought, well, they're old enough. They were 10 and 15, I think, 11 and 15. And I didn't think that it was going to be that big a deal. But it changes your family dynamics. It changes who's the baby. Uh, it changes how much time and attention they're used to. And even at that age where they didn't need much, um, it was surprising uh, how difficult it turned out to be. Anybody else? Well, Anne, I just want to thank you so much. That was um, some really important information that I didn't know. And of course, I don't specialize in this, but I think all of us carry a handful of clients that have adopted kids. And it's just really helpful to have a little bit more information to share with them. And thanks for your personal sharing too. Um, that just helps me understand the, the depth of the challenges that people face. Um, and it's good to see you. I haven't seen good you see for you. a while. <laughs>
So um, as we wrap up, we just want to remind you for CEs that um, you can, did we put the email, the email's on the flyer, right, Daniel? Yeah, it's on that, and uh, I put it in the, I put it in the. Uh, oh, wonderful. He's got it in the chat as well, and hope to see you next month. Um, I want to ask, please, even though you're. Books. Sorry? I'm sorry. I was hoping she could repeat the books that she recommended. Oh, okay. Um, the Connected Child. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what. There's something called the Archibald Project. A-R-C-H-I-B-A-L-D. The Archibald Project dot com. And it's in Austin. Okay. And they have an amazing book list. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I just wanted to ask you all, all um, if you had uh, difficulty getting onto the um, link tonight. Did anybody have difficulty? Yeah. Yeah. I did. All right. Well, we'll make sure that we have a good link next time. Apologize for that. And thank you again for being here. Daniel, do you have anything else you want to say? Nope, just join us again next time, and we'll do some psychodrama via Zoom. And I will still be on Zoom, pretty Never. sure. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Thank Good you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Anne. You're welcome. Good to see you, and I appreciate everything. Okay. Have a good week. You too. Bye-bye.